Thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking about predicting recovery in post-stroke aphasia. And I'm going to be looking at some imaging and medication variables that might help us determine who is going to improve at, versus who's going to either get worse or stay the same. So I'm going to talk about a, a series of four studies, and then I'll actually be adding a fifth study to look at a different imaging variable. Um, but the first four studies looked at kind of this same question in different ways. So there were two longitudinal studies, first to identify variables associated with the degree of language recovery over the first six months after strokes. So we were looking at change from the acute period, the first couple of days, to six months. Um, and one, <clears throat> one identified lesion sites associated with poor recovery, and the other identified the influence of medications and demographics, and also looked at the lesions. Um, we, then we used the data from these longitudinal studies of recovery to predict which individuals are likely to have made the best recovery, that is, have the best outcome of language after stroke. So the two cross, and these were two cross-sectional studies in independent samples of people with chronic post-stroke aphasia. Uh, and we hypothesized, based on our first longitudinal studies, that individuals with lesions involving left posterior superior temporal gyrus, which I'll call STG, or superior longitudinal fasciculus, the SLF, uh, are more likely to have re covered naming, that is, have a better outcome in naming than those with, uh, with these lesions. And secondly, we hypothesize that among in aphasic individuals whose lesions do involve posterior STG or SLF, recovery is greatest in those who consistently took a, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor on a daily basis for at least three months after stroke. Um, so our outcome variables that we focused on really had to do with naming uh, of pictured mm -hmm. objects or in narrative speech because naming is the most common and important residual deficits in people who recover fairly well uh, after aphasia and even those who recover poorly. Naming is almost always one of their residual deficits. So we use the Boston naming test and or we use the Western aphasia battery with the 60 item object naming subtest. We also looked at word fluency on the Western aphasia battery. And we looked at the cookie theft picture description. Uh, and you all know the cookie theft picture. And we counted the number of content units that are correct content units that are also spoken by uh, healthy controls. And this is from a long uh, a study done in the 80s by Yorkston and Buchelman, and they figured out basically normal controls always say pretty much the same things about this picture. So in the first study, the participants were enrolled within 48 hours after left hemisphere ischemic stroke with aphasia and reevaluated at six months post-stroke. And we uh, excluded people who were, had poor level of consciousness in the acute phase those who had ongoing sedation, who lacked premorbid competence in English, or had previous neurologic disease affecting the brain, um, and or contraindication for MRI. The mean age was about 55, which is common in our studies. We have pretty young patients, and 37% uh, were female. And we uh, looked at infarcted regions on diffusion-weighted trace uh, images which are very sensitive to infarct in the acute phase without knowledge of the naming performance using MRI cron and we carried out parcel based lesion symptom mapping looking at the proportion of infarcted voxels in each of 189 uh, anatomical regions on the Jeju MNI atlas um, and uh, then we looked at the associations between the proportion of damage to each region and the and naming deficits using general linear model, um, corrected for lesion volumes and corrected for multiple comparisons. And this just shows you uh, that most people did improve over the first six months, but about 20% of patients 
declined. And this is pretty much what we always see. Um, and then a few were unchanged. Uh, the mean improvement was about 10.6 points on the Boston naming test. So that's 10 out of 60 and um, or at 35%. And at six months post stroke, the areas where a higher proportion of infarcted voxels at the acute time point was associated with lower naming scores at the chronic time point was left posterior superior temporal gyrus and left superior longitudinal fasciculus after controlling for lesion volume and multiple comparisons. And so here you can see the posterior superior temporal gyrus and longitudinal fasciculus were the uh, only significant regions. And this just shows different views of the same areas. And in the right, that's kind of looking through the right hemisphere at the left hemisphere. Um, now, this is just kind of an aside, but there's been a lot of talk in motor recovery about proportional recovery rule that, uh, and one study suggested that the same was true in aphasia recovery, that you can predict the at onset what the outcome will be simply based on the severity because they, the claim is that everybody makes about 70% of maximal recovery. That is the, the most they can um, improve and then 70% of that. So somebody who starts out very low has a very large amount they can improve, but they only uh, improve 70% of it. Those who have very small amount of recovery uh, to achieve, they're already close to 100%, will achieve 70% of that, but that's basically very small. Um, so we did find a significant correlation, 0.50, but that means it can only explain about 50% of the variance. That there's a lot that's not explained by proportional recovery. And it, looking at individuals, they uh, deviated from the expected recovery by anywhere from minus 34% to plus 30% of the total score. So a lot of them deviated a lot. Um, and nearly half deviated from expected recovery by more than three points on the Boston naming test. So you can see there is a correlation, um, but a lot of it is these people who don't have much room to recover and don't recover very much because they don't have much room. And then a few who have a lot to recover on this end. Um, but if you, if you sort of block out can't really do it for you here, block out this corner, then you'd see there's really no recovery if you block out these who really can't recover very much. So our second study uh, looked at 30 stroke survivors of whom, uh, and again, the mean age was 57, same inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, and all of them had at least some language therapy. And they went through a, a large battery of language tests, but we really looked at as I mentioned, Boston naming test and the cookie theft picture, the number of content units, um, that is correct concepts uh, mentioned by normal speakers. Um, and we know that that content units does correlate with lesion volume in left hemisphere stroke. Um, and uh, we, we found that it correlated with the Boston naming test scores as well. Um, so it, uh, we looked at these at onset one month and six months and measured change uh, divided by initial performance. Um, and we recorded the use of antidepressants, which included selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, venlas vaccine, uh, deloxetine, and bupropion, well, butrin, um, without an evaluated uh, for depression using the patient health questionnaire. PHQ-9, um, which has a 91% sensitivity and 87% specificity for depression if they, you can compare results to a structured psychiatric inventory. So it's a pretty good measure of depression in, in stroke. And again, if, if we look at either the content units or the Boston naming test, we find that um, uh, a few patients are unchanged, most patients improve, but about 20% actually decline. And 37% of, of our patients use SSRIs, 
we did not have very many who took any of the, the other antidepressants. So we, I'm not going to show you any results for those because it was just too few, one or two of each. Um, can, and we found that continuous use of SSRIs in the first three months after stroke was associated with greater frequency of obtaining good improvement on the Boston naming test. That is 88% of those who took SSRIs and only 33% who failed to take SSRIs achieved the highest quartile of recovery. Um, and that was also true for correct content units that 100% who took SSRIs versus 44% who did not showed the best recovery. And SSRI users showed a greater mean improvement on a continuous scale um, than SSRI non-users. So the BNT, uh, average BNT uh, improvement score was 10.7 points uh, versus a decline of 0.5 uh, points in the non-users. And that was a large effect size, um, even though it is a very small study. And if we look at the SSR users, this is the percent of participants who showed good improvement. Um, and I already talked about these data, but it just sort of shows you uh, graphically here, using Boston naming test or content units is about the same. And then those who did not use SSRIs uh, failed to improve as much. Now, the higher rate of improvement in SSRI users could not be explained by a difference in groups in depression because, in fact, there was a trend the opposite direction. SSRI users were non-significantly more depressed than uh, the SSRI non-users, although this wasn't significant. But wasn't, it can't account, uh, a lack of depression cannot uh, account for the good results in SSRI users. And in multivariable analysis, SRI use, age, and education were all associated with improvement on the Boston naming test. Um, but only SSRI use was associated with good improvement independently of the other variables, when we control for the other variables. So from the longitudinal studies, it seems that the aphasic individuals without damage to left posterior STG and or SLF show greater improvement in naming than those with damage to uh, these regions. And aphasic individuals who take SSRI show greater improvement in naming than SSRI non-users independently of initial severity, education, and age. So then we uh, asked whether these variables can predict better outcome in chronic post-stroke aphasia in two independent samples that had really no overlap. Um, and the, uh, based on results of study one, we hypothesized that lesions in left posterior STG and or SLF are associated with poor outcome in naming in chronic stroke compared to individuals without damage to this, these areas. Now, medication use was not available in this uh, uh, cohort. Um, so we looked at 159 uh, participants who were enrolled at either University of South Carolina or uh, MUSC, Medical University of South Carolina, um, by studies by Julius and Leo. And they were tested at least six months after left hemisphere ischemic stroke. The mean was 34 months, um, and there was a, a large range. The mean age was about 60, and uh, about a third or so were female. The mean lesion volume was pretty large, 118 cc's, and the mean AQ was 63. Uh, participants in both cross-sectional groups were administered the Western aphasia battery, uh, revised, and our primary outcome variable of interest, again, was uh, naming, tested with object naming, subtest um, of 60 items. And this score is highly correlated with a BNT score um, uh, with a correlation of 0.88. Um, the methods are basically the same imaging methods as I talked about for study one. Lesion size was included as a nuisance regressor and we corrected for lesion for multiple comparisons using 4,000 permutations. Um, 
Only voxels where at least 10 participants had damage were included in the analyses, um, and we use NISTAT. So here are the results among the 159 chronic stroke survivors. The only lesion locations that predicted poor outcome and naming were the middle superior temporal gyrus, and that's posterior temporal, superior temporal gyrus in that it's posterior to the pole, but, but anterior to what uh, the JHU uh, atlas defines as posterior superior temporal gyrus. Um, and the SLF again. Um, so these regions need to be intact for patients to experience good recovery, good outcome and naming. Damage to post uh, central gyrus, anterior cingulate gyrus and thalamus had the opposite effect. So patients who had damage to the, these regions tended to name more items correctly compared to those who had uh, damage elsewhere. So it's not that having a lesion there helps your naming, it's just that compared to other people, uh, they all had strokes, remember. So compared to other strokes, they did better in naming recovery if they had these yellow lesions. And worse if they had these red lesions. And again, superior temporal gyrus, SLF, and then a little bit of superior <coughs> temporal gyrus that's in the middle, uh, but still posterior to the pole. Um, and if we look at the results of study one, with the acute patients, and study three, who were chronic patients in a different state, completely different patients, we see that the results are really highly similar if you look at the red areas. Um, so then for study four, we uh, made a hypothesis based on the results of study two, and I hypothesized that among individuals with damage to posterior superior temporal gyrus, and or SLF, um, those who continuously took SSRIs during the first three months would show better outcome than the non-users of SSRIs. The participants are shown here. They're basically the same as the ones I've talked about before. Um, damage to, post and what we found was that damage to posterior STG and or SLF was again associated with lower a rate of achieving the highest quartile in naming recovery. And again, a very big effect size of 6% versus 92% showed um, uh, the highest quartile of naming. And the highest quartile of uh, recovery of the WAB AQ also, again, 0% versus 83%. And the highest quartile of word fluency, so 17%. Uh, of those with SLF and or STG lesions versus 57% uh, of the other patient, patients without these lesions showed um, the highest quartile of word fluency. There was no difference between SS, in SSRI use between participants with and without posterior SLF uh, lesions, um, posterior STG and SLF lesions, um, again, 40% of those with lesions, without, with lesions and 35% without lesions used SSRIs. <laughs> and in multivariable analysis, damage to posterior STG and SLF was associated with lower odds of achieving the highest quartile of object naming after controlling for lesion volume, SSRI use, and months post onset. And even more impressively, among those with the posterior STG lesions uh, and or SLF lesions, SSRI users attained a higher accuracy on object naming is a continuous variable than non-users. So the, the SSRI users achieved an average of 86% accurate, whereas the non-SSRI users uh, achieved uh, an average of 45%. Uh, percent. And again, this was a large effect size. Those without ST, posterior STG and SF, SLF lesions achieved excellent object naming recovery um, with or without use of SSRIs. So if you don't have lesions there, you're gonna improve anyway. Um, but if you do have lesions to, to that critical area, SSRI users uh, do much better. Um, just as an example, this is a patient who had damage to left 
posterior superior temporal gyrus and superior longitudinal fasciculus, but still achieved the highest quartile of object naming after taking SSRIs <coughs> for three months. This patient has a smaller <laughs> lesion. Um, you can see in posterior superior temporal gyrus and SLF, um, and he failed to achieve the highest quartile of object naming, but never took his, uh, an SSRI. And you can see this patient who made better recovery actually had a bigger lesion. So in conclusion, aphasic individuals without damage to left posterior superior temporal gyrus and, or uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus are likely to make good recovery of naming. Um, and that was shown in, in two longitudinal studies and then confirmed in two independent samples of using an outcome, outcome data. And this was true whether or not they take SSRIs. Individuals with Damage to left posterior superior temporal gyrus or SLF have, are greater risk. They are more, but they're more likely to show good improvement in naming if they take SSRIs for the first three months after stroke. And this was shown in one longitudinal study and confirmed in an independent sample. Survivors uh, who initially had aphasia, and uh, we looked at outcome. So the implications are that the effect of SSRIs on aphasia re recovery still need to be confirmed in a randomized controlled trial. Um, however, um, when we do, when we want to design a randomized controlled trial, we want to show a big effect. So probably we want to target those who are most likely to benefit. That is, those individuals who aren't going to make recovery anyway. Uh, the individuals with aphasia due to left posterior superior temporal gyrus and or superior longitudinal fasciculus. And I should mention that other studies have found uh, that damage to these areas separately are independent risk factors for making poor recovery after aphasia. So then we ask, what else might affect naming outcome? Because this can explain a lot of the variants, but still not all of the variants. And we know that people, you know, it's not just predicted by severity at onset. It's not just predicted by lesion size. Um, it's not just predicted by where the site is. Um, also is somewhat predicted by uh, SSRI use, but there might be some other imaging variables. So white matter connections between undamaged nodes of a network are thought to be essential for uh, network reorganization and recovery. Um, and previous studies have shown that damage to particular white matter tracts um, results in impairment of various speech and language tasks. And I just uh, mentioned the Katani Mesulum study here, but there have been many studies looking at the importance of particular white matter tracts using DTI. Leukoareosis is not damage to a particular um, uh, white matter tract, but it's diffuse white matter disease. And it's thought to reflect kind of the health of the brain tissue. Um, there are many sort of possible causes of white matter damage. So B12 deficiency can cause hype, um, uh, diffuse white matter disease, um, head trauma, and uh, small vessel cerebrovascular disease is probably the most common but it's really the health of the brain tissue. And it's been associated with cognitive impairment in both uh, stroke survivors and otherwise healthy individuals. So mild cognitive impairment or uh, even worsening dementia. Um, there was also a study by some of my colleagues here showing that the severity of leukoareosis has been associated with the severity of hemispatial neglect following acute right hemisphere stroke, and that was independent of lesion volume. So we hypothesize that moderate to severe leukoareosis is associated with poor language outcome after stroke, independently of infarct <laughs> volume and time post onset. And we, we also predicted not just outcome, but change over time. So we looked at 42 patients with aphasia resulting from a single left hemisphere stroke, at least three months post stroke. Um, and uh, again, the similar uh, age group and about 52% women, 
We looked at Western aphasia battery object naming scores again, as well as the uh, word fluency scores and the aphasia quotient. And then some of the, for some of the measures, we dichotomized outcome as good outcome or the highest quartile for each task. Um, so in terms of image analysis, we did uh, volumetrics to determine the three-dimensional volume of the infarct. And then we looked at damage to three regions of interest because we had found that these were all important, posterior superior temporal gyrus, SLF, um, also called arcuate fasciculus. There's really essentially no difference between SLF and arcuate fasciculus, um, depending on how you define each. Um, and then we also looked at posterior inferior frontal gyrus, just because we know that's an area that's often important for language. And then our leukoariosis assessment, it was based on flare images. Flare images were evaluated for right hemisphere leukoariosis because you always see some white matter changes around the lesion because of Wallerian degeneration, the white matter tracts uh, that have cell bodies in the lesion are going to um, die back. Um, so we didn't want to look at the effect of the lesion, we wanted to look at the health of the undamaged brain. So we looked at the right hemisphere. We used the cardiovascular health study white matter rating scale, which has a range from zero to nine, with nine being the most extensive leukoariosis and zero being none. And then we uh, calculated Spearman correlations uh, between the C, uh, cardiovascular health study outcome or score and the naming outcome. We also uh, did a chi-square test to evaluate the association between a good outcome and that is the highest quartile of each language score and moderate to severe leukoariosis, which is defined as greater than five on this zero to nine scale. Uh, finally, we carried out multivariable uh, logistic regression where the independent variables were leukoariosis, the cardiovascular health scale score, lesion volume, time post onset, and damage to each of those three critical regions of interest, as well as comorbidities, including diabetes, hypertension, and depression. And the reason we did that is diabetes and hypertension are associated with leukoariosis, may be causative, and depression is associated with leukoariosis, maybe secondary to the leukoariosis. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that it wasn't the diabetes, hypertension, or depression that uh, was influencing outcome uh, rather than the leukoariosis itself. And the dependent variable was highest quartile in naming scores. So in univariable analysis, we found severity of right hemisphere leukoariosis is negatively associated with uh, object naming outcome. Um, and this was quite significant, as well as the word fluency outcome, that is the final scores um, at <clears throat> six months, the, or three months or later, sorry. And the, um, a leukoariosis score of greater than or equal to five, that is moderate to severe leukoariosis, was negatively associated with the highest quartile of object naming, as well as the highest quartile of word fluency um, when they were dichotomized. Then in multivariable analysis, we looked, uh, we found that damage to left uh, superior temporal gyrus, months post onset, and severity of right hemisphere leukoariosis together predicted outcome of object naming pretty well. So this was highly significant uh, with a pseudo R squared of 0.68. So that it could, these, the these variables could together account for about 68% of the variance in naming outcome. And these were the, the only things that were independently associated were left. This is really posterior superior temporal gyrus infarct um, and right hemisphere leukoariosis. Um, and if we put all the independent variables together, we could uh, pre uh, predict the highest quartile of word fluency, um, not quite as well. Um, but again, the only two that were significant were 
left superior temporal gyrus infarct and uh, the right hemisphere leucoariosis. Um, and these are just some examples. So this is a patient with a large left hemisphere stroke. And you can see there is white matter change around the stroke, as I mentioned. There has to be from malarian degeneration. But in right hemisphere, he, he had really um, uh, minimal leucoireosis, so tiny bit around the ventricles. Um, and uh, you can see this is just another slice of the same patient. You really don't see much at all. And this patient made good uh, recovery of naming and achieved the highest quartile of naming scores. This patient um, actually only had a very small lesion in the thalamus that you can see here, but had a lot of right hemisphere, sorry, right hemisphere leucoireosis as well as left hemisphere leucoireosis. But this is what was scored. So this was uh, counts as moderate to severe and he failed to achieve good outcome even though his uh, impact was very small. So in conclusion, moderate to severe leucoireosis in the right hemisphere is associated with poor recovery of naming independently of infarct volume, time post onset of stroke, and damage to these three uh, critical nodes of the language network, as well as independent of uh, uh, comorbidities. Right hemisphere leucoireosis is uh, direct, it may directly hinder naming recovery or it may be a general marker of brain health. And we really can't tell from this. So it could be that the white matter tracks, the network, the homologous language network in the right hemisphere is critical to recovery. And so if it's damaged by white matter disease, then the person won't make uh, recovery. Or, or as I mentioned, it could be that there's just poor brain health. So we know people have good diets, exercise a lot, do you know, are generally healthy or don't have diabetes or hypertension or have those things very well controlled, do better than those who have poor brain health. Um, but our results could contribute to prognosis um, and further studies are really needed to determine if leukoireosis can prospectively predict language recovery or response to treatment in larger independent samples. We did not use treatment as a variable just because everybody has such different types of treatment. It's really hard to control in this uh, retrospective study. So I just want to thank the people in my lab who did all the work. Um, and they are listed here as well as all of our collaborators at CSTAR, um, our, the other stroke attendings and neuroradiologists who work with us. And of course, I want to acknowledge funding from uh, NIDCD, who's just been terrific. And these are the people in my lab. This is uh, two years ago. This was just this past uh, summer. Um, and I'm happy to take questions now. We'll first take questions from our audience. Yes. So Kirana is asking me, um, is there anything special about people who take SSRIs after stroke? And it's a great question. In our hospital, about half of people are prescribed SSRIs after stroke, even if they weren't taking them before and even if they're not depressed, because of the FLAME trial, which was fluoxetine uh, for motor recovery. And it showed that people who took SSRIs made better motor recovery, who took SSRIs specifically for three months after stroke, made better uh, motor recovery than those who didn't. And that was independent of depression. So it may, also there's theoretical reasons. SSRIs um, obviously keep serotonin around longer. Um, and serotonin is essential for uh, neuroplasticity. So serotonin and norepinephrine and dopamine are all neurotransmitters important for neuroplasticity. So there was one small study that also showed that uh, there was better cognitive recovery using pretty gross measures, but cognitive recovery in uh, people who took SSRIs versus uh, not. But 
Um, there hasn't been a big trial in aphasia, but I think we'll do one. Um, and uh, so we can see they weren't different in terms of lesions. Uh, they weren't different in terms of lesion volume. And it may be the people who aren't prescribed, it may be sort of attending uh, specific. Some of our attendings just prescribe it to everybody and some don't prescribe it to any. Um, there's also some people who don't want to take it or they have contraindications. Any other questions, Donna? Are there data that speak to functional communication changes and you know, better improvement among SSRI users, you know, family members, or maybe the patients themselves think their communication is much better compared to people who aren't prescribed? Right. So Donna's just asking if there are data on whether the SSRI users are uh, show better functional communication at you know at home and with their friends than non-users, and they're not. Um, the closest we have. That's why we looked at the content units in the cookie theft description as instead of just picture naming, because picture naming is mm -hmm. not a very uh, sort of uh, socially valid task. But picture description might be, you know, this is the amount of content you can uh, you communicate accurately. And as you may know, the content units don't require specific words, but they require accurate communication of a, a particular concept. So you can say, you know, uh, lady washing dishes, or you can say mom instead of lady, or uh, she, or the woman, or, uh, you know, any kind of um, thing that refers to woman. Um, and washing dishes, you can also say doing dishes or washing up after dinner or, you know, any of these con things that, that convey the same concept. Any other questions here? I wonder why the, S the SLF, well, the IFOB, I'm not being sorry the other way around, the SLF and not the IFOB were involved. Uh, so, so the question is, why did we find SLF as opposed to ILF? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. It may be we didn't have power to identify um, the essential uh, <coughs> role of the ILF um, because it also is, is a sort of a white matter tract that connects important language networks. Um, but it may be less commonly um, uh, infarcted in, in patients, and so we might not have had the power to find that. Whereas the SLF we know is um, uh, also an important route in the language network, important white matter track, um, but it's also probably more commonly affected by stroke. Um, and as you mentioned that uh, you don't know, well, can't specify in detail what kind of treatment the patients were doing, at least for the last study. But do you have an idea of how many of these patients were in, engaged in therapy while they were in the study as well? So Vanya asked if we know anything about the treatment of the patients, um, and we don't. They all received some treatment after their stroke, but some weren't currently involved in, in therapy. Um, some, it was just a couple of sessions, some it was, you know, two years, it's, it was very variable. So we don't know. We were uh, talking about, uh, thinking of another question here about fluency. Was it letter fluency, category fluency? So the question is uh, the fluency, I think it's just animal fluency on the web. Yeah, yeah, just the number of animals they can say it in 60 seconds. Anyone else? I'm happy to take questions from uh, other centers. I will have to bring back my chat box. All right. Any questions from here? No. Margie, can you hear me okay? Is it Julius? Yeah, okay. All right. I, I think you can hear me. So the first question I had was about the leukoaryosis and just relationship to overall health, because I think that's, that's kind of related to uh, long-term recovery. The other one was, uh, do you know if there have been any studies that have looked at the progression of leukoaryosis after stroke? So whether that contributes to this decline that we're seeing in some patients? Um, so 
the first question was about, I think from Julius, about uh, leukoariosis and sort of overall health. And I'm not sure there are any data on those two things. However, my gut feeling is that there's a huge um, relationship between overall health and uh, leukoariosis. And I say that because leukoariosis is strongly correlated, as I mentioned, with hypertension, uh, smoking, diabetes, um, and uh, all of those things are associated with poor overall health as well. So uh, I think that it's a great question and I'm not sure uh, anyone's looked at it because they're all so strongly correlated. People who smoke don't exercise and uh, don't eat well and that sort of thing. So not sure which of those variables is independently um, uh, <clears throat> associated with leukoariosis or it's just kind of the overall uh, health of the person. Um, second, I think there is a study showing actually that uh, the degree of the amount of exercise or the number of hours of aerobic exercise per week is inversely related to leukoariosis. I believe there's one study showing that. Again, that can be cardiovascular health, brain health, etc. And both are associated, both poor health overall um, and leukoariosis are both associated with uh, cognitive impairment. So I, I think, you know, your gut reaction is right that overall health is probably uh, related to leukoariosis. Your second question was about, has anyone studied leukoariosis after stroke? Um, and I don't think people have done exactly what you're asking. And I would be interested in looking at leukoariosis change in leukoariosis in the opposite hemisphere, because we know that you're gonna develop white matter changes in the affected hemisphere because of valerian degeneration. But in the other hemisphere, I don't know. And yes, I do think that th these patients um, are the ones who are more likely to decline and show quote unquote vascular dementia after a single, sometimes small, small stroke um, because they just have poor overall brain health. Grigori has a question. No origin. So I, uh, I'm curious, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, so what do you think? The effect that you saw in SSRIs, do you think it's something that's specific about their mechanism or is, do you think it's going, uh, it can be observed with um, other types of antidepressants? So I'm, the question from Gregory was, uh, do I, what do I think the mechanism of the effect of SSRIs is? And I, I do think it might be specific to serotonin that I, I, there are a lot of animal studies that show um, SSRIs are important in recovery of uh, after, of motor recovery in mice, for example. Um, and you don't see it with other things that don't affect serotonin. Um, possibly other, and not everything's been looked at very well. Um, so my gut feeling is also norepinephrine, acetylcholine. A few studies have looked, for example, at Aricept in post-stroke uh, aphasia recovery, and it might be helpful. Um, and I bet together, uh, because you need uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, and acetylcholine together for neuro plasticity, it might be that a combination of these neurotransmitter medications would be the most effective. Archie, I had another question about the SSRIs. You, you mentioned that it was not, the, the effect that you noted was not related to depression. I was just wondering whether that meant the depression at the intake, so at the beginning, or the depression at the moment of the retest, so when you measured the recovery. Another way to ask that question is, were, were there no differences in depression rates as, under the influence of SSRIs? Did they not affect the depression at all? So we only looked at depression at outcome. 
we don't have scores for depression at the acute stage. And it's possible that those patients were more depressed acutely. Although, again, I don't think that's why they were given SSRIs. And we were looking, we, actually that's not true. So we know they were taking SSRIs for the first three, continuously for the first three months. Um, but we don't know their depression scores acutely. Um, and I don't think, I don't have any data on this, but I don't think they, the SSR, people who are prescribed SSRIs were more depressed at the beginning either. Um, they, I, I don't have data, but I know they weren't more depressed at the time of outcome. And yes, SSRIs are very effective at treating depression. Um, and so if we, we have the, uh, information on SSRIs, and now we're prospectively collecting data from the acute stage on both depression and SSRI use so that we can try to answer that question. Um, does it have anything to do with their depression at the beginning, the change in their depression scores, and so on? But we don't have those data yet. I have yet another question, if you can hear me. Um, you, you, you showed on your screen, uh, I think it was related to the studies two and three, you had the yellow areas where if they had a lesion there, more anterior and central uh, gyrus there, um, uh, they uh, did actually better relative to patients with other lesions, whereas lesions in the PSTG, um, those patients did worse, right? So. Between these two regions, the yellow and the red, do you think that, or, or uh, can you talk about whether there's a clear watershed in terms of the vasculature that creates either a lesion in one area or the other? Yep. So that's a great question. So the yellow areas include uh, ACA territory. So anterior cerebral artery territory is all here. Um, but also includes some very superior frontal that's MCA territory. Um, and but cingulate is mostly ACA. Um, and so we see that, uh, so I su suspect uh, that people who have ACA strokes don't have as much naming problem. Um, that would make sense. Um, and so their outcome and naming would be likely better as well. I think we have online questions, RG. I don't know if you can uh, see the chat box yourself. Paula, so question... Paula says, how about the impact of alcohol use on local areas as an aphasia recovery? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, and I don't have any information on it. <laughs> We do ask patients about alcohol use, um, but we also uh, are aware that not everybody tells the truth about their alcohol use. Um, so we don't know. Just in general, in stroke, there's some data um, that suggests that up to two glasses of wine or two beers in men is associated with uh, at least a lower recurrence of stroke. Um, I don't know about outcome, um, but anything more than that is associated with higher. And in women, it's one glass of, of wine a day or one beer. Um, I think it has to do with size probably more than gender, but um, we don't have very much information about outcome and alcohol. And I don't see anybody, any other questions? No, I think we're good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Good to see all of you.